Well, good afternoon and welcome to another one of the King's Chambers Costs Seminars. Um, this afternoon, it's the Costs and the Administration of Estates, uh, together with um, some thoughts about a couple of cases in the Court of Appeal. Um, I'll be speaking. Um, Matthew Smith is here too, and we'll be doing a sort of double act uh, in order to cover all the topics that we need to go through with you. Um, but let me sort of step back and explain really what the context of this all is. Um, there is a problem here which needs to be grappled with, and the problem can be put really in these terms. Um, when somebody makes a will, they will usually do so through um, the offices of their solicitor. And one of the points that can then arise is having made the will, it is going to act as the executors. And often, um, not invariably of course, solicitors will act as executors, but also retain their own firms to administer the estate. But what happens then when the executor and the beneficiaries fall out or the relationship breaks down? And part of the reason why it might break down is due to what are perceived to be excessive charges uh, being levied for the administration of the estate. So we want to touch upon briefly uh, the removal of a professional executor, um, the question of how the firm's charges can be challenged or not, depending upon which side of the fence you're looking at this from. Consider Section 71 of the Solicitors Act uh, of 1974, which has proved problematic over the years. Consider briefly actions for an account or declaratory relief against the solicitor. Uh, and have a look at the case law, which is, as I say, uh, quite interesting with a number of cases going to the Court of Appeal uh, in the next six to 12 months. So to put a little more flesh on the bone, um, I should say that the way we're going to deal with this is there are no slides because otherwise Matthew and I would be shoved to the far corners of the screen, but we're going to send to you after the seminar to everyone who signed up a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that we prepared, which has got all the references and case names on it, so you can look at that uh, at your own uh, 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 leisure. Um, I should also say that I'm conscious from having looked at the attendee sheet that there are a wide spread of people here, including lawyers who are starting at the beginning of their careers, uh, and also, of course, lawyers uh, who are a long way in and quite grizzled and battle hard. And I am, of course, talking to you, Dave, at this particular point. So what um, we'll try to do is give everybody, whatever your level of seniority, um, six or so uh, points to take away. And then, you know, hopefully this will have been a worthwhile uh, exercise for everyone. So if we start with the problem, it's also the opportunity. As long ago as 2009, there was an article in The Guardian which indicated that uh, you know, at that time, 1.25 billion in fees was being charged by high street banks and solicitors collectively for dealing with the administration of estates uh, through grants of probate or indeed letters of administration. These sums are, of course, paid out of the estate. A reduced pot therefore follows for the beneficiaries. And the first question that anybody uh, would ask when consulting a solicitor um, is how do I challenge these charges? What is the route? And in particular, uh, what uh, has uh, arisen as an issue in the recent case law is what can in non-perjorative terms be described as, as collusion. If a solicitor is appointed as executor and appoints her firm to administer the estate, how practically would a beneficiary challenge these uh, charges? There will be scope um, for the appointment of a solicitor, quite properly, who has done the will. Uh, and there's a Law Society practice note from September of 2020, which deals with the regulatory considerations and I suppose also the ethical dimension. Um, certainly, when a will has been drafted, the solicitors uh, can put themselves forward or suggest that they may want to consider um, appointing them in terms as a professional executor. But the client care requirements have to be dealt with very carefully. And in particular, there must be transparency of charging. And the practice guidance draws a clear distinction between acting as executor and acting in the administration, because the two are quite different. 
uh, and can have quite significant effects if they uh, if if sight of that division is lost and they're all lumped, the charges are all lumped together in one bill. Um, I'd also like to point out that because this is by and large non-contentious work, um, in effect we start a little further back in the Solicitors Act with consideration of Section 57. It's entirely possible to have some form of non-contentious business agreement in the alternative to a conventional retainer. And although it's a little old now, the case of Gemma Trust and Liptrot from 2004 in the Court of Appeal has got a very useful exposition as to how a solicitor can structure their retainer uh, and consideration of what factors would indicate that the charges being made are reasonable or perhaps unreasonable if the guidance in Gemma Trust and Liptrot isn't followed. I think it's also right to bear in mind um, that as well as um, the civil procedure rules that would apply to any subsequent assessment, um, when one considering non-contentious that cost, you have to look at the solicitor's non-contentious business remuneration order of 2009, which covers some of the same ground as the civil procedure rules, but also imports a different requirement. Whereas most people are familiar with the requirement the cost must be reasonable, where they're non-contentious costs, they must also be fair and reasonable. And the two concepts can actually uh, be quite different uh, in, in terms of where uh, matters go. So, um, what I'd, uh, I'd like to do now is effectively, having set the scene in terms of what the issues are, um, turn to consider the first of the points, which is the issue of the removal of an executor, really because they're in the saddle and you want to take them out of the saddle to stop them charging so much. But as I said, we're playing, and we're playing a volley today, so I'm going to pass the, 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 the button over to Matthew um, just to give you a little outline about how you might remove an executor uh, to stop the charges accruing, and then we'll start to look at the detail of how you challenge the charges that have already been accrued. Uh, yes, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, in dealing with removal of an executor, then it seems to me that you've got to remember that this legal situation presents almost a, a perfect storm of legal issues for people to deal with. As Andrew has just mentioned, um, there is a very real issue here about capturing of the solicitor's client. People who prepare a will might, uh, for good reasons or for bad, uh, identify as an executor in the will with a, a clause for remuneration, another solicitor who uh, is unlikely to be a beneficiary to the will and whose charges may not please the beneficiary. Along with that go all the requirements for transparency that can be complained about if they're not complied with at a, at a later stage. And uh, once that comes to complaint about the bill, not only is there, as we'll be moving on to later in this uh, seminar, the very real questionable nature of the extent of the court's power to assess a solicitor's bill um, uh, arising from the process of executorship. But as you all know, that presents a whole range of unsatisfactory vagaries that go along with a solicitor and client assessment. Is there a statutory bill? That gives rise to its own arguments. Is it in time? That gives rise to particular arguments under Section 71 of the Solicitors Act. What um, are the special circumstances if they have to be relied upon? All of the arguments that many of you will be used to they will all be in the mix. So once you come to the point of uh, trying to remove an executor, you may well already be uh, heading down the line of um, spending far more costs than any beneficiary is ever going to be happy with that may on occasion take up far too much of funds that should be available for distribution. Um, and that gives rise to this question. <clears throat> there might well be a preemptive issue to um, appointment of an executor other than the one envisaged by the will. 
because those applications have to be raised in the high court, um, then uh, costs inevitably uh, will already be in view. And it may well be that some of you will know that a will has been prepared either by solicitors that you know, uh, who may find themselves in difficulties once the person who made the will, once the testator, um, passes away. Or it may well be that you know that there is somebody who uh, has maybe a, an entitlement uh, under a will uh, that hasn't yet arisen, but you can see a storm coming. There is a very good reason for reviewing wills at the outset and perhaps amending them to change the position of a solicitor executor where it's in the interests of the beneficiary to do so or where perhaps the testator hasn't appreciated what he or she may well have put in train. It may well be if you explain to the testator the consequences of the appointment of the solicitor executor, that testator may well change his or her mind. And if that can be done uh, before death, uh, then of course the opportunity to rewrite the will is um, uh, perhaps a way of saving quite a considerable amount of money. Once it's too late and uh, once there is the clear approaching appointment of an executor and probate is about to be granted, then there are two ways. Um, two essential ways. There are about four different ways, but some of them are arcane and some of them involve uh, the appointment of a judicial trustee, which is not a, really a practical way forward when trying to dispose of um, the uh, administration of an estate uh, in any way that's cost sufficient. And the first way is section 116 of the Senior Courts Act 1981. It's quite clear on the authorities, and you'll see uh, going on to West Law or looking at any annotated version of these statutes, that there is a substantial body of uh, case law. And uh, it, it, again, it's all up for argument. But if there are special circumstances prior to the appointment, the, the um, executor can be changed at the, at the will of the court. And uh, if you look around, we can uh, give you the link to various recent cases written by uh, other counsel where these applications have succeeded or failed. But in the article from The Guardian that Andrew referred to, uh, the gentleman who set up that business funded a, a, a claim that went before uh, his honour Judge Behrens, a case called Khan and Crossland, which you'll find a summary of uh, on, on Mortel. And Mr. Khan was unhappy prior to the appointment um, of a solicitor executor with the prospect, he being a beneficiary, the prospect that this executor was going to uh, render charges that would mean that there was less for him and his sister as a beneficiary. So before his honour judge Behrens, he brought a section 116 uh, Senior Courts Act application. And his honour judge Behrens, a, a much missed, very bright, very pragmatic, very wise senior circuit judge in Leeds, found there were special circumstances. The executor wasn't prepared to stand down. He said that the application was an abuse of process. Uh, and what he concluded was, firstly, the, C, the discretion is very wide. Secondly, it's not necessary for the administrator to be discredited in any way. Thirdly, whilst you have to take account of the testator's choice, it's a relevant factor, uh, but it's not a, not a decisive one. And in this particular case, there wasn't much known about why the testator had appointed the uh, solicitor as executor. It was quite clear to the judge that the deceased had spent limited time giving his instructions. It seemed to the judge, no doubt, that he maybe uh, did it not thinking about the effect that that might have on the distribution. And a major factor playing on the court's mind, it seems, was the fact that the claimant and his sister were each of full age, each of full mental capacity. They were united 
in their desire for the executor to renounce his role. They knew how they wanted to divide up the estate. And the judge found, you may think surprisingly, that all of those cumulatively amounted to special circumstances. Uh, and thus uh, their uh, application, which was said to be an abusive process, succeeded. No doubt, unfortunately, at some expense, um, but no doubt uh, part of that was met by the resisting um, putative executor. After Grant, the alternative approach is under Section 15 of the Administration of Justice Act. Uh, again, there is a considerable, uh, considerable body of uh, case law that deals with the Administration of Justice Act. But the overriding objective of the courts is to see the efficient carrying out of the trusts established by the will. Uh, and if the court can see that there is anything getting in the way of that, there needn't be any misconduct. Sometimes it's just that the disagreements between the beneficiaries uh, and uh, either uh, the um, uh, administrator or any of the parties is simply gumming things up and slowing things down, then the court will intervene uh, and uh, substitute executive. Um, those are the two ways. It's regrettable that they're bound to cost a lot of money. Um, but if that is successful, there then uh, comes the question, or if it fails, uh, there then comes the question of what to do about uh, any bills that arise uh, and what the court's powers are under Section 71 of the Solicitors Act. Because, of course, uh, there will be some people who are beneficiaries who don't even realize um, the problem until they get the distribution accounts and they see what's been taken from the estate in the way of solicitors' charges. And Andrew is now going to take you through the controversy that currently rages in relation to Section 71 of the Solicitors Act. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I think it's also right to note that all of these cases will often be hard cases and there will be a variety of factual circumstances. So as Matthew rightly says, where you have a situation where the beneficiaries, all of them, are in agreement that the professional executor has to go, that's a very good springboard to get the executor removed. Conversely, it may be that the testator, for good and proper reasons, has appointed a solicitor as the executor classical example to my mind would be where the testator has a, a former spouse and possibly a prior family um, where there may be issues of friction uh, between um, the former and the current spouse when it comes to the distribution of the estate on death. But all of those are issues in the mix and I think also Matthew makes a very significant point that a lot of the time all of this will come out uh, at a point relatively late in the day. Uh, when the bills have come in, when the estate has been shrugged, and then it's a question of to what extent can the beneficiaries claw something back uh, through the assessment process. I think many of the people on the line will be familiar with Section 70 of the Solicitors Act, which is the uh, starting point, of course, for many solicitor and client assessments. But in uh, this context, we have to move to Section 71 of the Solicitors Act, which is dealing with a situation where someone who is other than the party, even chargeable with the bill, uh, has paid or is or was liable to pay a bill uh, and wants to apply to the High Court uh, for an assessment of the bill, effectively to stand in the shoes uh, of the um, person who uh, has paid the bill or is liable to pay the bill. Uh, and the significance of that is, of course, that the classic example will be in the context of what we're talking about, the solicitor, who is the executor, who has effectively approved his own firm's charges uh, and has decided they are reasonable and that they should be paid. Well, he would do that, wouldn't he, in a sense? But of course, the beneficiaries will want to potentially use Section 71 to bring a, a challenge. Now, there's a very interesting point here about um, the scope of Section 71. Um, and it goes back to the 19th century, at least, and the Solicitors Act of 1843, which is whether 
uh, Section 71 contains two rights to an assessment, or but a single right to an assessment. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Section 71 can be used in a wide variety of contexts. One example could be where, in effect, um, someone who is a um, mortgagor finds themselves liable to pay the mortgagee's fees. The contract of retainer is between the mortgagee and the solicitor, but the mortgagor, uh, who is ultimately being hit with the bill, wants to have them assessed. So that's an example of where Section 71 one would undoubtedly apply. Where you're dealing with a situation that a trustee, executor, administrator is paying a bill, then there is an argument that you don't start with Section 71 one, but you start with Section 71 three, because it's a second and independent right to that contained in the first part of Section 71. Why does this matter to anyone other than costs nerds? Well, it matters quite a bit due to the state of the authorities uh, on the case. Um, and um, we'll come to that in a moment. It's also right to know that Section 71 contains what I'll describe as ancillary provisions, dealing with, for example, things like time limits and so on. But for these purposes, we're not going to get into the gubbins of that today. So um, Section 71, in summary, um, really boils down to this in terms of the issues. First of all, is it one right or two? And that will matter when we look at the case law. Secondly, bear in mind that the uh, Section 71 didn't drop out of the sky fully formed in 1974. It has a long pedigree going back to uh, at least a statute from 1843, if not before. Um, and you have to ultimately make Section 71 fit to the situation where you have what I termed non-pejoratively collusion where the professional executor solicitor effectively approves his own fees uh, when the work is carried out by his firm. It's also right to note as well that um, there can be quite a distinction between work done as an executor and work administering the estate, because work done as the executor could theoretically be done by anyone. Work done administering the, the, the estate uh, is, of course, what um, the day-to-day -day administration of the estate entails, the legal work in that. And this is where a charging clause comes in. There should be a charging clause in the will where there's a professional executor, enabling them to charge not only for the work done effectively by their firm, but the work that they do uh, acting as executor. And this in turn also raises strategically an issue when the beneficiary comes to see you and wants to make the complaint, is their complaint against the solicitor's firm who did the work, or are they really wanting to target the executor or administrator who agreed the bill? And that can be quite significant, as we'll see in a moment. So I want to open up um, these issues by talking about a case called Tin Martin Interiors Limited against Aiken Gump LLP. I always get a little free song when I read cases of this nature, because of course, most lawyers want to appear in the law reports, but they want to appear in the law reports because of the skill of their advocacy or the skill of the representation and advice they afforded to a client. They'd rather not end up in the law reports as a named litigant in a case where the allegation is that they've been overcharging. But I'm afraid to say that that was the context in which Aiken Gump found themselves uh, in the court of appeal. And the essential problem in this particular case um, is perhaps the problem when considering how you challenge um, the, the fees of a, a solicitor or professional executor. The Court of Appeal drawing upon a lot of 19th century authority made the point that there's a conceptual oddity here in that on the one hand, Section 71.1 gives you a right to an assessment. But on the other hand, this is to stand in the shoes of the person who is chargeable with the bill. And the starting point, therefore, is that the person who is chargeable with the bill has already agreed it, said it's fine, and probably paid it. So what the Court of Appeal said, almost compelled by wording of the statute, and in particular Section 71.1, is to say, well, the actual nature of an assessment is extremely limited. It's much more limited than under Section 70. In fact, it could be described as a blue pencil test, 
where you can only strip out on assessment um, items that clearly shouldn't be there and have no basis for being there. And in the case of Aiken Gump, it was lumping in a set of costs relating to insolvency or bankruptcy proceedings, which were just beyond the scope of uh, the costs that the mortgage was liable for in that context. So what the long and the short of it was, was that the Court of Appeal said, well, actually, um, this Section 71.1 um, route won't really help you, um, mortgage or, uh, because of the limited nature of, of the remedy. And therefore, your better bet is to seek to bring a claim for an account against the mortgagee um, or seek a declaration as to the sum properly due rather than to trouble the SCCO with a, a Section 71 assessment. Now, that might be all well and good, but then certainly there have been a number of cases where the problems or practical problems with that um, approach have been illustrated. And one that you'll see in the notes to the handout is a case called Muscle and Patience, which, as I recall, is a decision of His Honour Judge Matthews. Um, and in effect, what was sought to be done there was not to go down the assessment route when challenging um, professional fees, but to ask for an account. Um, and the approach that was taken by the court in that case was to suggest that the account is actually not the sort of remedy that the Court of Appeal might have thought it was. Because all you have to do when you have an account is prove that the money was spent in relation to administering the estate. Plainly, if there are items in there which don't relate to the administration of the estate, they come out. But well, that's really no different than the blue pencil test applied in the Aiken Gunnett case. You don't have to establish on an action for an account that it was a money reasonably spent. And so you need to go further and establish something like fraud or breach of trust in terms of the items on the account uh, to uh, establish a basis for a deduction. So the question then is what do you do? If as a beneficiary you get a bill um, which uh, appears to be about 25% higher than it should be, uh, but you have on the one hand the Aiken Gun fruit which says well actually we're only going to look at this in the broadest of details to see whether there are whole tranches of costs that shouldn't be in here and if the costs are, are, are proper costs, but probably a little bit high. We can't help you in the SCCO. Or you bring an action for an account saying these costs are 25% too high. And for an action for an account simpliciter, the, the court says, well, that's not the test. That's not the approach. We're simply looking to see whether these are properly in the account. And then you're in the position where you simply want to challenge the reasonableness of the time but you have to go further and establish breach of trust or fraud or something of that nature, uh, which you're probably going to struggle to do, because that may not be what the essence of your, your case is all about. And that is the real problem. And when wearing my other hat as gladiator in the arena, um, I've had to defend solicitors acting on this basis. Um, I recall at least one or two occasions where it did, the challenge didn't get off the starting blocks. Uh, because you, you could point to the authorities and say, well, what you want to complain about doesn't seem to be something you can complain about once you start to look at the case law on it. And so matters have remained in a curious state of limbo, um, certainly since the muscle and patience decision, but arguably uh, since the Aiken Gump decision, with nobody quite sure either what the route is, challenge someone's fees, or what you have to prove in order to successfully challenge them and even which court you start your, your case in. But uh, one of the pleasures of um, being a lawyer is, of course, that the law is always changing. Uh, and there have been another um, couple of cases which are starting to shed light upon what is a very vexing problem. I should say, before I pass the baton over to Matthew to take you through some of the more recent case law, that you've all been really good. We haven't had a single question so far and it may be that you've simply forgotten you can ask us questions, or maybe that we're so um, hypnotic in terms of our presentation that you, you haven't reached for it yet. But if you've got questions, I, we welcome them as we as you as we go along, because then we can sort of wrap them up into the presentation. Uh, though, of course, we'll try and save five minutes at the end for any questions people have got at that stage. But Matthew, perhaps if I pass. Pass the button over to you for 
the next step? Uh, yes, of course. And um, um, here is my bet. If I win this bet, um, I invite you, nothing more than that, but I invite you to make a £5 donation to a charity of your choice come this October. Uh, because on the 17th and 18th of October of this year, the course of appeal has slated for hearing um, the the most important case that's going to clarify the scope of Section 71, a case called Kerrig, um, that was decided by Cost Judge Brown and has been leapfrogged directly to the Court of Appeal. So my bet is this. My bet, as Andrew said, at the moment, the way that Section 71 is interpreted in a mortgage case uh, as a consequence of Tim Martin against Aiken Gum on the authority of the Court of Appeal is that uh, a person who is not the party chargeable with the bill, who seeks to challenge the bill uh, maybe of a professional solicitor client paid to his or her own firm, stands in the shoes of that solicitor. And if that solicitor hasn't challenged in time, or if that solicitor has paid more than 12 months ago, or if that solicitor has explicitly, with full and transparent knowledge, approved all of the costs, then standing in that solicitor's shoes isn't going to get you very far. And if your rights as a beneficiary are just the same, and similar circumstances prevail with a solicitor executor who has been charged money by an associated firm or perhaps his or her own firm, then again, that beneficiary isn't going to go very far. <clears throat> My bet is this, that the Court of Appeal uh, will be persuaded to conclude that these are two rights giving rise to two separate remedies. And I, I say that for uh, two reasons. First of all, as Andrew has said, um, the um, I'm going to share a screen, which is section uh, 71, which I hope is being uh, shared now. First of all, as Andrew said, section 71 is the melding of the old sections 38 and 39 of the old Solicitors Act. So originally it was two separate provisions. But if you can see for a moment section 71, one, it's not really apposite to describe the circumstances of an executor because it says where a person other than the party chargeable with the bill which could be a beneficiary for the purposes of section 70 all of the, all of this is so good so far then it come up come on to this bit either has paid well the beneficiary rarely will have paid or was liable to pay well the beneficiary other than a very loose sense is not liable to pay that bill. The only sense in which the word liable there can mean anything is in its loosest and most colloquial way. Uh, so it seems to me that a beneficiary simply does not come at all within section 71.1. Uh, note the different wording in section 71.3 where a, a trustee, executor, or administrator has become liable to pay a bill, the professional uh, executor, then on the application of any person interested in any property, here's your, here's your clear beneficiary. Uh, the beneficiary doesn't have to be liable to pay anything under uh, subsection 3. And whereas section 71.1 only allows the person challenging, as Andrew said, to stand in the shoes of um, the uh, party chargeable, section 71.3 goes much further. It allows the bill to be assessed on such terms, if any, as it thinks fit. Um, and so far as uh, such terms as it may think fit, and taking into account the provisions of section 70, um, then there's no doubt that section 70, at the time limits under it, will be uh, taken into account. And uh, I'm sure, as some of you at least will know, uh, His Honour Judge Rich KC, in the case called McElroy, uh, ex decided, not very much, but decided that there is a discretion and that the absolute time limits under Section 70 uh, don't apply, but you will uh, needless uh, take them into account. 
what that means is that of the two recent cases, uh, one, I, I fear um, it, it won't matter a, a great deal, um, but uh, one uh, is unlikely to find favour in the long run, uh, not for uh, want of trying, but that's the case of Shepherd and Co against Brealey. The real meat of Shepherd and Co against Brealey, which is also going to the Court of Appeal, but won't be heard until next year, a decision of Mr. Justice Kavanagh, who was sitting with Costs Judge Brown in uh, an appeal from Costs Judge Rowley, uh, was simply dealing with uh, the fact that fees, professional executors' fees, could not be recovered because the will did not, as Andrew said earlier, it should be included, contain a, um, I'll, I'll stop the share, did not contain a charging clause. Um, and the appeal was purely on that basis. But on the way to getting there, although it wasn't the subject of the appeal, and won't be the subject of the appeal, I doubt, uh, before the Court of Appeal in Brealey, on the way to getting there, Master Rowley effectively concluded that Section 71.3 and the rights and powers under it available to a beneficiary could not be distinguished from the rights under Section 71.1, and thus the beneficiary stood in the shoes of the solicitor liable to pay the bill, and uh, the remedy was unlikely to be of uh, a great deal of benefit to the beneficiary. Now, Cost Judge Brown, having sat as an assessor in that case, came to precisely the opposite conclusion. For a whole host of reasons, he concluded, uh, uh, and it, it's, a, it, it's a very good recital of, I said this was a perfect storm, as you read through this judgment, um, it started off with the application for assessment, and uh, as is sometimes good practice, full breakdowns had been sent in the forms of timesheets uh, with the invoices, and Cost Judge Brown even was only just satisfied with the adequ adequacy of those to conclude that they were, uh, in the end, a constituted a statute bill. Uh, they were, in the end, enough. But, uh, in short, Cost Judge Brown completely disagreed that Section 71.3 was, in effect, a damp squib. And uh, he concluded that uh, not only uh, could there be a discretion to allow assessment beyond 12 months after uh, payment, that was not determinative. He had a discretion. Uh, turning then to the solicitor and client presumptions, of course, they are a matter to take into account, together with whether or not the uh, costs were unusual and some stretching of um, the CPR when considering the warning about unusual costs perhaps not being recoverable from the other party. He, he drew an analogy with old trust law cases, which are effectively that the, the, the executor, the key to all of this is the executor is a fiduciary and the executor in those circumstances owes a duty only to incur costs which are reasonably necessary for the proper distribution of the estate. And that should be sufficient to stop the dangers of what in some cases could be collusion. And in that way, the court retains full power under Section 71 3 uh, carefully to investigate the bill. And in this case, there was a four or five fold exceeding of estimates that had been given to the solicitor client. And to cut a long story short, this was just an application for the assessment. And uh, Cost Judge Brown concluded uh, that these bills ought therefore to go for assessment, and he so ordered. And of course, that's just the beginning of the story. But in the process of that, Cost Judge Brown painted how an assessment could theoretically 
work out. So he's setting up for a court of appeal to be able to deal with how far a court will be able to go in assessing one of these bills. And arising from my bet, my wager earlier, I suspect that the Court of Appeal will be very tempted by the idea that they can identify where somebody is operating on a trust and somebody is, an ex, uh, is a fiduciary, and they will be able to use that tool of this person being a fiduciary as a, as a way, as a route in to investigate costs, to ensure that um, costs only reasonably necessary to achieve the purposes of the trust are incurred. And that will be a very happy result. And the reason it will be a very happy result is going back to this perfect storm idea. If the Court of Appeal don't do that, what they potentially lay the world hostage to is clients being captured without there being sufficient awareness of what is going on. Beneficiaries who don't give instructions as to what is going on, but ultimately being met with a bill for what has gone on at the end. I would echo what Matthew has just said. We've actually had a question, and the I'll deal with that first. It says, to what extent, if any, does the ability to challenge costs differ where you're dealing with an intestacy? So there we're dealing with letters of administration rather than an appointment of an executor in a will. But if we look at the wording of section 71.3, it applies wherever there is a trustee, executor or administrator who has become liable to pay a bill. But let's come back to this case of Kenig, which Matthew has taken you through. Um, when I read this um, judgment, and it's a doorstopper of a judgment, I've wish I could have been a fly on the wall watching the um, assessment unfold, because it was obviously one of those cases where, irrespective of what the advocates were doing or arguing, the judge became more and more interested in the case, and so he's written an extremely lengthy judgment, uh, which obviously shows that he's put a, a lot of work into the case and coming up with the answer that he has. There's a lot in it. It deals with issues of privilege which he found uh, weren't problematic, even though this is um, effectively an assessment between a third party and a solicitor rather than a client and a solicitor. He dealt with the issue of time limits and how they might be applied. He dealt with the issue of special circumstances and how that fits together in this context. And the key point, as Matthew has indicated, is he distinguished Aiken Gunn and holds that Section 71.3 is independent of Section 71.1. And that means a much wider concept uh, can be applied than the blue pencil test. The familiar points, again, as Matthew's indicated, the failure to adhere to estimates, that, that sort of argument can be raised. The other case which uh, Matthew touched upon was that of Shepherd and Company against Petrie and Breedley. And that case, again, going to the Court of Appeal, but on a much narrower basis. In that case, there was no charging clause in the will. And so when the bill of costs went in, it included not only the costs of administering the estate, uh, but also the costs uh, of the professional executor. And the problem was that without a charging clause, um, there was no basis upon which the cost of the, the, the executor uh, could be held to be recoverable, or rather there was a basis, but the court wasn't prepared to entertain it. Um, if you don't have a charging clause, there are certain other arguments you can raise, um, and you might find that there is argument to be had in your particular case, but they're in increasing order of unlikelihood in being uh, 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 something capable to be run. Uh, could do you have express agreement for all the beneficiaries as to the charges? Um, can you use Section 31 or Section 29 of the Trustee Act? Can you go back to the old case of Boardman and Phipps from the 1960s to say the court as a matter of discretion should approve things? So that's um, going to the Court of Appeal, but that is uh, further back in the queue than the Kennig case, which was in fact, again, leapfrogged to the Court of Appeal by the judge who plainly appreciated the significance of what he was doing. So let's turn to consider what is the significance of these cases. We, we've just had a question, what is the position where there is only one executor 
and they are a professional executor and they instruct someone in their firm to deal with the estate. Well, that is the very essence of what we've been discussing for 45 minutes. So it's all in the slides uh, and they'll be coming out to you. But the significance of these cases, if we step back, is really this. Um, you will have seen, unless you've been living on Mars for the last few years, the rise of solicitor and client assessments in the context of low value personal injury claims. Um, those cases may very well be dead as a result of Belsner and Caratish and the approach that the Court of Appeal has advocated to the costs of the assessment. But all of these cases um, are, well, are very much what I would describe as proper cases, big bills, big value cases, where there are beneficiaries have got an axe to grind. And I would have thought that the personal injury sector, having had um, its own costs war in the last uh, few years, um, the sector of the profession which deals with the administration of estates is probably very much going to be in the, tar in, in the firing line for the next round of effectively solicitor own client challenges, even though, as we've, uh, we've covered, it's not solicitor own client, it's a step further removed. But the principle will be the same. People disappointed with it, with the solicitor's charges, um, looking for firms to take on these cases. And so I would say that if Kenny goes the way that Matthew has indicated it may well do, then the floodgates will open. Um, and then it's a question as to who's going to pick up these cases and going to run with them. And more than more than that, just to chip in for a second, um, it is if if, uh, if this aspect of Kenning is upheld, then the floodgates will be truly open because costs Judge Brown found that each of the invoices that had been sent to the solicitor, first of all, had been paid very promptly afterwards. Each one was a statutory bill. The earliest of them, and at, at, the, at the terms of his judgment, he found that for the purposes of comparison with the time limits in Section 70 and taking those time limits into account as a factor, time started running from service of the bill on the executor, which the beneficiary may not know about until some time later. But that time having started running, as a factor for the judge to take account of, costs Judge Brown sent these bills for assessment, and the first of them was delivered to the executor about two and a half years prior, and had been paid about two and a half years prior. So you, you, those of you who work in this field uh, now have the spectre of the floodgates opening in respect of assessments of bills with far more generous allowances of time pursuant to the exercise of a value judgment rather than a statutory time limit. It's also right to say that there are always in different areas of work certain vulnerabilities. Um, in, for example, commercial cases where we deal with solicitor own client assessments or indeed inter partes assessment, one is very struck by the fact that attendance notes are often quite a rarity. All the work is done and evidenced by the emails. Um, but one of the consequences of that is that you can actually get perhaps deeper cuts into people's time because of the lack of um, notes which effectively provide the explanation and the narrative to it. In relation to non-contentious costs where solicitors will be charging um, in a particular way, they need to think very carefully about how they evidence and record their time if this takes off, as it may well take off, as another subspecies of solicitor and client assessment, um, are you going to be blocking out uh, block time effectively? Um, do you have attendance notes? Um, is your time spent as crisply as it might be? And what about the team meetings which often take place? Are these proper instances of delegation? Or are they, as they may be painted, uh, ways to jack up the hourly rate collectively? Uh, and when you throw into the, the mix the fact that you can have value-based charging as well as the hourly rate, um, then one can see that there's an awful lot to argue about in the context of these cases. Given Andrew's Friesel about solicitors' names appearing in the law reports for the wrong reasons, um, it's very sadly ironic, but it may make this case all the more memorable, not just because it's a tremendously important case, 
Um, but many of you will have seen, because Google is your friend, that Thompson, Snell and Passmore is in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's oldest mortar. It, it might soon become the world's best known mortar. I, I think I think I think we can leave it there, Matthew. Now we've got a few minutes left. Have we got any more questions? Um, as I say, there will be a set of slides going out with the references to the various cases and whatnot that we've dealt with. Is the Solicitors Act even fit for purpose anymore? I suspect whoever wrote that question knows the answer. Yes, exactly. When you get to the situation where solicitors need to take advice as to their own obligations and responsibilities under the Solicitors Act, then I would say self-patently it needs to be thrown on the bonfire. Mr. Sunak needs to bring out his shredder and stick the Solicitors Act in it. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Right. Lovely to see you all again. And um, uh, good to speak to you. We'll say goodbye. Cheerio then.